is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's good to see each of you here today. I appreciate so much when people go the extra mile to do things in in the best way they possibly can. And I appreciate many of the members here who go out of their way to, to do special things uh, to make the church better, to make our worship better, to, to take special time and effort to put into things. And, and that goes to our teachers, it goes to those who uh, lead public prayer, those who go out of their way to do good things. And God bless you. A lot of times, you don't receive recognition for the hard work that you put in. But let me tell you this, God sees everything that we do. And God is appreciative of everything that we do. So please, mark that down in your heart that God loves you and appreciates what you do. Parents who bring little children, I know that's hard to have to get yourself ready. I, I know it takes a long time to look this good. <laughs> And if I had to get somebody else ready to look this good, it would never happen. So God bless you for taking that extra time. Don't you judge me. How many times have we heard that? People, people get so wonky about people judging them. And oftentimes we think that the Bible teaches that judging is any time that we make a discernment. Is there a difference between judging and discerning? Is there a difference between uh, saying what the Bible says on a particular subject and pointing out the difference between the way someone is living and the way that the Bible tells us to live? And isn't the, the sweetest, kindest thing that you could do for me is to help me correct something that is wrong in my life? Now, oftentimes, when we get into trouble for judging, it's because of the attitude that we have when we point out somebody else's error. Perhaps we need to realize that when somebody is outside of the will of God, that there's al already a sensitivity of self-judgment, and they already feel bad about what's going on, and then for someone else to point that out, just bothers them that much worse. And what's, what usually happens is they will lash out at the messenger. They will, they will uh, feel this, I don't know if you would call it remorse. Uh, maybe it's some kind of, of sorrow for something that they've done. And it turns to anger very quickly. So it's, it, it comes upon us as messengers of the truth to consider them consider that they are in the wrong and that we love them enough and are tender enough to not drive them away remember in galatians chapter 6 the bible tells us that if a brother is overtaken in a fault you who are spiritual restore such a one with humbleness considering yourself lest you also be tempted. We all have the same ability to fall away from Christ, and if I was overtaken in a fault, how would I want somebody to rescue me? Would I want them just to point out my error and go on and not give me the tools to come out of that sin? Would I just want somebody to say something ugly about it, or would I want them to honestly try to help me overcome the, the wrong that's in my life? John Paul read so beautifully from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, and I, I truly believe that this is one of the most misunderstood passages in all of Scripture. Because at the beginning it says, judge not, and then as we go on, we see that there is a judgment that takes place. There is the necessity of helping a brother out. In the very statement that Jesus says, Judge not, lest you be judged. What is he doing? He's making a judgment. He's actually saying, hey, look, do this in the right way. So he's made a discernment that there's people who are judging in the wrong way. So you need to be careful. You ever thought about the fact that you're not my judge? How many times have you heard that? 
And it usually comes from those who are overtaken in a fall. You're not my judge. Um, <laughs> if it's your spouse, you have to go with tenderness, right? And why not carry that into all relationships? God is my judge. You're not my judge. Those are usually the first words that come out of the heart of somebody who truly is outside of the will of God. And they're protecting themselves. What does the Bible say about judgment? What does the Bible teach us about judging and the necessity of it? But also the, the necessity of having our hearts right to begin with. Am I really judging someone when I am only doing what God said? I'm convinced that no one who really says this, meaning don't judge me, that they would agree with this next statement, that in the end of all things, all of us are going to be judged. Let's look at a couple of places in Scripture that talk about a judgment day. A time when everyone on this earth is going to be judged by God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, the scripture says, For we must all, everybody, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether it's good or whether it is evil. So we're all going to stand before Christ. Every one of us is going to give an account for the things that we have done, whether they're good or whether they're bad. So God is keeping a record of all that we do and all that we say. There's going to be a day when I have to confess. Not only confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but that I have lived outside or inside of the will of God. I hope that when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that, that I will have done the things that are approved of by God. Things that will have made him happy so that he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't want to hear those words, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. The day of judgment, that day, it's going to be a, as we sing, there's a great day coming. And I've always thought we put those verses in the wrong order. You know, the second verse is there's a happy day coming. And then the third verse should be uh, a sad day coming. We always have the last one first, but I don't, I don't understand that. But we're all going to be judged by what we're doing right now. In fact, the judgment already takes place. And I see the day of judgment not as a pronouncement of whether you did right or wrong, because that judgment is made right now. We're already told how we are to live. So we're judging ourselves right now, and we only receive sentence for those things that we've done in this body at that time. So really, you're, you're setting your own verdict every day that you walk in this life. We're all living either according to the will of God or outside of the will of God. The Bible teaches us that. In John chapter 12, verse 47 and 48, Jesus is saying that, that He didn't come to judge the world. But then He goes on and makes this startling re revelation that we are all going to be judged by the words that Jesus says. That Jesus has put forth the wording of, of how we are to live. And, and when the books are opened, whether they are the Bible itself or the words that Jesus spoke, God will be able to hold up our life next to what Jesus has said. And if they match, we're in good shape. But if they're out of harmony with each other, we won't be in good shape. Notice that Jesus said, the very words I have spoken will judge him on the last day. I want you to underline that. Because this implies that if I see somebody who is living outside of the harmony of what Jesus has said, I am not judging that person. The Bible itself is the judge. The words of Christ are the judge. So if I'm going to correct somebody, if I'm going to help them overcome fault in their life, I better not base it upon what I think. But instead, I need to base it upon what Jesus has said. That's the standard. The Bible, the book, the words of Christ are the standard by which all of us will be judged. And that is what I need to teach and to preach so that people know how to live. 
And it's up to me to use that scripture in a way that will bring them out of the fault that they're in. John writes about that great day of judgment and he he paints a picture of everyone that has ever lived on this earth standing before the great God of heaven and the books are opened. And the things that are written in the books will be brought forth and everyone will give an account on that great day. And at the end of that great day, those who have done righteously will enter into heaven. And those who have done unrighteously will go into hell. And the Bible even tells us that those whose names are not found in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. That scares me. I like that song that we sing. My name is in the book of life. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. I rise above all doubt and strife to read my title clear. I love that. You see, I have my name written in the book of life, but you know what? Jesus can mark it out. If I don't live according to him, I can be disowned on that last day. I'm saying all of this because the Bible does give us a standard by which to judge whether something is good that I ought to do or it's bad and I should stay away from it. And I make that judgment based upon Scripture and I can see it in my life whether I'm pleasing to God or displeasing to God. And if I can see that in my life, then I can see it in the lives of those round about me, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so the Bible then is telling us that if somebody is living outside of the, the instruction of Christ, we are to help them come back to a knowledge of the truth. Jesus, in giving the Great Commission, said to go into the world and preach the gospel to everyone. And then do you remember what he says? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. So there's this teaching thing that goes through the entirety of our lives. We get to the point that, that we have to uh, grow. We, we go past being an infant that just comes into Christ, and we are to grow. Now, if I see somebody who is not growing... It's my responsibility to help them grow. If you know a child is not receiving proper nutrition, what would you do? Wouldn't you buy them something to eat? Wouldn't you see to it that this child is taken care of, that they have food and clothing? It's evident when somebody's life has all the things that it needs to, to subsist and to live correctly. The same thing is true spiritually, brethren. And with the discernment of Scripture, knowing the will of God, we are to look around us and to restore those who are out of harmony with the will of God, with kindness, with love, with, with compassion, considering ourselves. What a, what a great thought that is. We have a responsibility to each other. Proper judgment. Judge right with righteous judgment. Proper judgment in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we find a person who was out of harmony with the will of God, in a, caught in a gross, sexual, immoral position. Here we have a, a young man who has a sexual relationship with what I consider a stepmother is what I'm assuming is taking place here. And Paul tells them that this, this matter has become such a problem and you're accepting of it and it's pulling you down and it's, it's affecting the entirety of the church. So what I want you to do is to recognize this individual who is living out of the harmony of God's will and I want you to fix that situation. In fact, I want you to Hold back fellowship with that person. What does that mean? It means that they ought to feel in your presence that they have done something wrong that has offended God. That we cannot have a everything is okay, we're all headed to heaven, everything's going to be just fine 
feeling when we're around that person. If you go through Scripture, you'll even find that, that there are some people that we're not supposed to eat with. That there are activities that we're not to participate in together until a person is restored back in harmony with the will of God. So proper judgment based upon Scripture, based upon what God has said is right and wrong. When we see somebody who is wrong, it's our responsibility to love that person enough to go to them and help them fix what is wrong. This young man was bringing down the whole church. But Paul is saying, look, if you will purge out the sin, purge out the old leaven, then the whole church will heal and the whole church will be strengthened by it. What's the thing about leaven? We have anybody that's ever cooked a cake here? Have you ever noticed how yeast or leaven works? You put it in there and it doesn't just affect the one little part that you put it in, but it affects the entire cake or bread or whatever else that you would put it in. Put the leaven in. That's the way sin is. Sin in the church doesn't just affect the one person that's participating in the sin. But my sinfulness, your sinfulness, will spill over into the lives of the rest of the church. And that's exactly what was happening here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's almost as if they had adopted the mentality that, ooh, look at us. We are so tolerant over this sin. And they were basically waving this sinfulness around to the whole world and saying, aren't we in fashion? And you know, it seems that way in the world today with a lot of different kinds of sin that if we don't embrace that, we call it tolerance, right? If we don't embrace all kinds of sin and, and just allow people to live however they want to, then we're being judgmental and we're being unkind and we're being unfair. But the Bible tells us to instead rebuke, reprove, reprove exhort, that person to come back to the Lord. And that's exactly what takes place when Paul writes this 1 Corinthian letter, verses 1 through 5 of chapter 5. But as we go to the next book, we find out that this person who had been judged, who had had fellowship withdrawn from, that they fixed the sin in their life. So you see, when judgment is used correctly, not only does it restore fellowship with our brothers, but it restores the whole church's fellowship with God. It, it's hard to really explain this. So let's, let's look at it in a physical way. When there's illness in your family, maybe it's a sick child, who's profoundly sick. Have you noticed that their illness doesn't just affect that person who is sick, but it affects the parents and the other children? My next youngest sister, Darla, uh, had what they thought was cystic fibrosis. And she was a sick little girl. All the way from the time she was 10 until she was about 17. She was very, very sick. And we had to even change our diet. <laughs> How terrible. You had to eat certain stuff and couldn't eat other things. And it affected our entire family. There were places that we couldn't go because if Darla was exposed to certain germs, she could have died. That's true in the spiritual sense as well, that when one of our brothers is sick, it affects the entirety of the church. But once that person is made well, then the whole church is well. The family starts acting differently because that person is well. Not only rejoicing, but now we can go places and, and guess what? We can eat liver and onions again. Woohoo! How many of you like liver and onions? Best stuff ever made. Man, oh man. But the Bible tells us to judge with the idea of restoring that person. If the Corinthian church 
had not judged, if they had not gone to this person and said, look, you're living out of harmony with the will of God, that, where would that brother have spent eternity? In hell is what the Bible teaches us. So it's up to us to ascertain by the actions of somebody whether they are living in harmony with the will of God. And if they are hell bound, we ought to love them enough to turn them around. Now, there is improper judgment. In John chapter 7, in verse 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Remember that we don't know the entirety of a situation. And we don't know what's going on in that person's life. So dealing with somebody who is in a sinful situation, we need to go in very, very carefully. Because we don't know what kind of abuse might be going on in that home. We don't know what kind of problem has brought that person to acting the way that they are. And if we truly love someone and we're truly concerned about them, we're not just going to say, well, you're going to hell. You old sorry person, you're hell bound. And then walk off and leave them like they are. That's not true judgment. Don't just look at somebody and automatically make the assumption that they are wrong. Judge with right judgment. So improper judgment, the wrong way, Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, very telling verse. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for, for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. What's he saying? Look, if you're sinning in the same way, fix your own self too. Fix what's out of harmony in your life. I'm I telling you what, if, if somebody is struggling with the same thing I'm struggling with and they're condemning me for it while they continue on, that's like when my dad used to say, don't do as I do, do as I say. That used to just go all over me. How... How crazy is that? Aren't we to set the example? Wouldn't it be better for us to say, okay, look, seems like both of us have this problem. Why don't we help each other? Why don't we make a society amongst ourselves to fix the problem in our life? I help you. You're my accountability partner. Let's fix this. Don't just say, you sinner, you're doing this, but fix it. Notice that God wants us to bring people to repentance. That's what judgment is all about. Is to help somebody turn their life around. And you're not going to do that with the wrong kind of attitude. What does it mean to be a hypocrite? Two-faced? In fact, the faces of theater, you know, the two masks in theater, there's one happy face and one frowny face. And really, the person wearing the mask, you don't know which one they are on the inside. They may be something completely different. So to be hypocritical is, is to have a, a second face. And oftentimes, as Brother Marshall Keeble, Keeble would say, we have two faces and we care not which one we turn toward God. Let us make sure our hearts are right. Romans chapter 2. When then you teach others do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. This pretentiousness that I am better than you doesn't ever help anyone trying to save someone from sin. What was the way that we put it as kids? Holier than thou attitude? You ever heard that? Someone who gets on their high horse and you don't want to listen to anything that they have to say. Why? Because usually their life is out of harmony with what they say. And for them to condemn me for something that they are doing in and of themselves is an affront not only to me, but also to God. So get your heart right. Judgment starts at home. Judgment starts, as we read there in Matthew chapter 7, 
it, it's pretty comical, the hyperbole that Jesus uses. He says, you know, look, you have this big honking log in your eye. You've got this two by four stuck in your eye. And you're trying to get up close enough to someone to get the speck out of their eye that you keep knocking them in the head with the board that's sticking out of your eye. How ridiculous is that? Jesus is saying, look, pull the log out of your own eye so that you might actually be able to help someone. So judgment begins at home. Make sure that your heart is right before you go to judge someone else. I'm not saying that you will be perfect because we will never get to the point that we're sinless and holy enough to be the judge. Let God's word be the judge and let us work together to fix sin in our life or even in the lives of others. Without proper judgment, how could we do the following things? Notice in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, how could we restore someone who's overtaken in a fault? If you couldn't judge to see whether or not a person is right in the Lord, how could you accomplish that? In James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, how could we bring back the sinner and save that soul from death? if we couldn't judge someone to be a sinner. How would you know they're a sinner if you can't judge? And then in Romans chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, how could we bear the failings of the weak? How could we build them up if it's not our place to identify those who are weak and have a sin problem? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 14, one of the most beautiful passages, and I think that it underscores best the way that I think judges ought to be. How can we admonish the idle? How would you know someone is idle? How do you know if somebody's idle? Well, they're not doing anything. That's how you know. How do you encourage the faint-hearted? How do you identify someone who is faint-hearted? Someone who's barely hanging on to the truth. Someone who's, who's on again, off again. Who's not 100% for Christ and therefore they're weak in their spirituality. We can identify them. How can we help the weak? Here in this passage, it says, be gentle with all. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25 and 26, how would we correct with gentleness? To help one escape the snare of the devil? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 21 and following, how could we rebuke the arrogant? Teach the arrogant to be quiet? How could we do that if we don't use proper judgment? Sadly, those who object the most to proper judgment judge in the very way that Jesus condemns. Those who say, do not judge me, are the ones who are standing up with their heart out of harmony with the will of God and are judging other people. That's not what we need. Matthew chapter 7 is telling us to have proper judgment in the right places. I promise you, that if you look around, you will find people even in the church at North Loop that are struggling, trying to be faithful to God. And they don't need somebody standing on their head saying, look how terrible you are. But instead, they need a hand up. They need somebody to help them find the path. And the only way that you can do that is to have a heart that's right with God and be trying to live correctly yourself. Sometimes when we've overcome a sin problem, it's easier for us to help somebody else that has the same sin problem because we can give them the steps that it takes to get right with God. So discernment based upon Scripture is the proper way to judge. If you're here this morning and are out of harmony with the will of God, judge yourself this morning. Lay down the scripture. If you've done all that God has said that you must do to be a child of God, if you've done that, I'm glad. If you have not done that, then you need to fix that today. Now you also know what it takes to remain faithful to God. And you yourself know, if you look at your heart, is it right with God? And are there some things that you might need to change? We as your brothers and sisters today want to help you. And we want to encourage you. We'll pray with you. We'll become an accountability partner. We will do whatever it takes to help you as you help us. This church needs all of us serving God to the best of our ability.
Why don't we do that while together we stand and sing? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid and I think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light.